Okay, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Patreon podcast. It's Thursday, June 9th, 2022. And uh, for my patrons, uh, this is exclusive for you for keeping me going financially. And uh, But I think this is going to be a very important episode. And so I am making it available to the public in three weeks um, on June the 30th. So if, if you're a patron, um, you know, you've got that added bonus of getting it out. So, uh, and if you're watching live, let me know how we sound and look. And um, so I think I am probably the only person here who did not know Michael Shea personally. But of course, I've read his work and I wanted to do a Michael Shea podcast this summer. And I, I emailed uh, Laird Barron a while back and he had some suggestions about who to invite. And, um, and so here we are. So I, I asked some other people here, um, Paula Grand, for example, really wanted to come, but couldn't make it. Um, so, and a few others that I asked, but, but here we are. And we, Cody Goodfellow, our friends, Cody Goodfellow and John Langan said they'd be here. So uh, they probably will be at some point. So anybody, you guys, welcome. I'm Mike Davis. I run the Lovecraft Easing podcast and, um, Thanks to my patrons for making this possible. And why don't we start with Linda and then move on. Um, if you want to introduce yourself, Linda. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, I'm Linda Shea and I'm Michael's widow. Um, he passed in uh, 2014, so it's been a while. Um, and we were married for 35 years. So <laughs> I, um, I got to know the man pretty well. Um, so I feel a little abashed at being with so many uh, luminary writers when I myself am not in that category at all. But um, one thing I do feel that's, that I've done that's useful is that since Michael passed, um, there have been several posthumous publications that have come out containing unpublished work, unpublished stories, um, just a bunch of stuff that we can talk about later. I don't want to go into it. And I feel that I've really, you know, contributed a little bit in that way. And I'm glad to be here. And thank you, Mike. And thank you, everybody else. Oh, of course. Uh, why don't we move on to Laird? Hey, Mike. Uh, it's really, it's good to be here with everybody. It's good to see everybody again. Some people I haven't seen in a long time. Um, Laird Barron, I write horror, noir, uh, mystery. I live in the uh, Hudson Valley near the Catskills, and um, I'll leave it there until we get to the actual conversation, but uh, this is pretty important. Uh, Michael Shea was really important to me, um, especially as a writer, but also I got to hang out with him and Linda a few times, and um, really good memories. Yeah, I, I do think what got me thinking about this is we did a podcast with Cody and uh, Philip and uh, you and me and i think was somebody else there i can't remember um but we were talking about the importance of of place in stories and in, and in novels and, and you brought up michael shea and when you visited him for the first time and right so. um just real quickly yeah i wrote a i've written a, a, several essays about that involve michael either directly or allude to him and his work i mean that's how important he was to me is to me and sense of place yeah that was a big one i wrote a um, an essay about the importance of place and how he did it so well and so um i don't know so, so memorably and i think one of the times we were on your show cody and i were talking about other unrelated stuff and we were you know every time we talk about geography as it pertains to writing and geography as a character a genius loci that kind of thing uh, if you talk about it long enough, Michael, I don't care what we're talking about. Michael Shea's name will will bob up there. Yeah, that's and that's what happened in that conversation. Yeah. Hey, John, how are you? Okay. Uh, good. Good to see you, um, Mark. You want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, Mark Laidlaw. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, writer of random stuff for science fiction, fantasy. And I knew Michael and Linda for a year. I, well, I was a fan of Michael's from 
around the time I, I think I was in high school or college when uh, Angel of Death came out in, in FNSF and then um, read the autopsy the minute that came out. Basically, I retired from a party that was going on to read the autopsy while I was at a party. And then I think uh, met the Shays not long after that and, um, you know, became uh, friends with, with them and kind of been that way ever since. So nice to be here. It's always fun to talk about Michael and get, get more people exposed to his work and, you know, share the stories. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. And before I forget, uh, Jennifer, uh, Jennifer, you're going to kill me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mangle your last name again, even though you were on the podcast. Jennifer Bruclar, I think what she said, I would love to have a link to that essay, Laird, so, um, that you were referring to. So, hey, Sam, you want to introduce yourself? Um, I'm Sam Hamm. I'm uh, primarily a, a movie and TV writer, um, working right now in comic books uh, as well. Um, I wrote, uh, you know, the original uh, Batman movie, and I'm now working on a comic book series for DC, which revisits that universe called Batman 89. Um, <clears throat> I knew Michael by accident, uh, just through a, a friend of mine who was an effects producer uh, on movies. And uh, he called me up one night, and we, we lived a few blocks away from each other. And he said, uh, oh, I've got this guy I'd, I'd, I'd love for you to meet. I'm sure you've never heard of him. He's really obscure. But uh, my wife is really good friends with his wife. And so uh, they're going to be coming over to my house. We're going to, you know, have like a barbecue. If you wanted to just wander down and say hi to him, that, that, would, that would be great. And I said, sure, I'd love to. What's his name? And he said, Michael Shea. And I said, all right, I'm coming to your house and I'm camping out until he <laughs> shows up because... I had uh, one of those experiences, which was similar to what Mark is describing. I can remember the day vividly uh, when I picked up uh, that issue of fantasy and science fiction containing the autopsy. And I read, I read The Angel of Death before in fantasy and science fiction, uh, which I you know, read religiously as, a, as a, a kid and a youth and a middle-aged man and now as an old man. Uh, and uh, I took it home. Uh, I, I lived uh, three blocks away from the subway station with the newsstand, which the magazine was. And I, you know, my habit was always to read the short stories first. And then, you know, you work your way up to the longer pieces. And I just opened it and I glanced at like, you know, paragraph, the Michael Shea story. So then I was gone for the next hour, hour and a half, however long it took me to, to sit there and read it. And, um, I, I really thought it was one of the most um, awe-inspiring things I, I'd ever read. I mean, I, I still it's 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 lived in my head ever since, along with a bunch of his his other stuff. And so, of course, I began uh, seeking out whatever I could find of his, and, and I had the you know good fortune to to meet him and Linda and to hang out a little bit with him, not as much as I, I would have liked, but um, I, I just. I, I don't know what to say beside the fact that I really loved him. Uh, he was just a, a he was a, a big, burly, uh, kind of seeming roughneck of a guy. And um, just the lightest little scratch, you would find a sweetheart underneath. And I, I just thought he was, not to mention one of the most talented, but one of the most charming uh, people that I knew and I, I still miss him you know I wish he were I wish he were cranking out stories right now uh, Henry what about you yes my name is Henrik Muller and I'm a filmmaker from Sweden and also now a novelist as a horror novel that is coming out and um, it has come out in Sweden and, and the translation will be ready July but uh, enough about me and over oh, what, what's Shea. the name of that I'm curious. Uh, the Swedish title is uh, Bertel ni Malmö, and uh, that means the executioner of Malmö, because it takes place in 1712 during the plague, and that's sort of a wraparound to a contemporary story. But anyway, yeah. the English title will be up for debate, so uh, we'll see <laughs> All right. what we will call it in English. Anyway, um, uh, 
strangely enough, it was Michael's passing that brought attention, uh, his att attention to me. And uh, it was at the uh, 2014th uh, H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival in Portland, Oregon. And uh, they had a sort of a, a small ceremony of some, uh, some sort, if I can. Um, uh, were you there, Linda? Do you know anything about this? Was no, this correct? I, uh, no, I didn't go to that one. Well, uh, it was Brian Callahan, the um, director of that festival, that uh, as shortly after this ceremony uh, told me, yeah, Michael Shea, that's someone you should really check out. He's a very talented horror writer. And uh, I did, of course, and I wrote, first of all, I read the autopsy and I was impressed. But what I didn't know was that I actually read Michael's work in the 90s, uh, where I read his, read his fantasy stories, like uh, this one, The Minds of Behemoth which is, uh, it, for everybody who has read Michael's fantasy stories, they have a lot of horror elements to it. And uh, the one that I'm holding in my hand right now, for those who are watching the live podcast can see, uh, it, uh, it takes place in a sort of hellish uh, inferno world where Niftaline and his companion go uh, deep down into the mines to extract some sap from a giant spider, a monster spider. Well, it's amazing. I can't recommend this enough. Yes, I'm angry seeing those copies because I lent mine to somebody, never saw them since, and they're impossible to find now. So one of my um, dreams is that, you know, all of my stuff will get reprinted in, you know, editions that everybody can easily get a hold of it. It's so hard to find that stuff now. Those books what's are- But what's funny is that the Russians have done like two editions, one, <laughs> one of Symbolis, one of Nift, um, and now they're doing another a collection of the autopsy and other tales. But the Russians really like the Nift books. You know, <laughs> it's- uh, I don't know. I'm, I wish gonna they would... my, I'm gonna put you in my will. All you have to do is I'll do it. <laughs> I think I'll just go kill the person I lent them to. That'd be more direct. That would yeah. Another, another way to do it. More efficient. Yeah. First I'll get first yeah. I'll get them to leave them to me in their will, and then I'll <laughs> easier than asking for them back. Yeah. Well, I see uh, in case I forget to mention it later, um, that there are several books on kindle unlimited just for those who are on a tight budget but if you have kindle unlimited um mr K kenny harm if i'm saying that right i've read the book but uh colorado times 4.99 on kindle and uh demiurge the C cthulhu mythos tales of michael shea is on kindle edition uh kindle unlimited as well so there's that uh john Want to introduce um, yourself? Sure, I'm. I'm John. Explain Langan. why you're here at all. Uh, many people have asked that question. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, explain yourself, sir. Actually, to, in some ways, I'm here because of Laird Barrett. Um, if if I'm I'm being fully honest, you know, um, I, I I know I was aware of Michael before I met Laird, but but when Laird and I started corresponding and and became friends. You know, his one of the writers he always referred to, one of his touchstones was Michael Shea, Michael Shea, Roger Zelazny. You know, there, there were some, a few like sort of key names that, that he just kept coming back to. And I think I met Michael three times. I was thinking there was we, we met once and uh, uh, he and Linda and, and myself and Laird hung out at, at the World Fantasy Convention when it was in Saratoga um and uh, sort of wandered around and and had a lot of fun and um we attended I, I was thinking about this that we were all at an indian restaurant in saratoga with ramsey campbell and laird was there and paul tremblay was there and michael cisco was there and st joshi was there and man you know like an assassin from the future could go back and just like she completely changed the course of weird fiction well willem uh pugmire was willem there as well yeah that, that, and, that, and, willem, and willem took a lot of sustenance from from michael yeah like he would yeah. have been one of his biggest you know advocates so yeah, yeah. yeah that was a really that was a he there was other people too but gordon i don't know if gordon made it to that one we all hung out <laughs> with gordon let a hole in the wall later but that was a really important you know I, I like it was the council of 
Council of Worms. <laughs> I was going to say Elrond, but you go with worms. That's, you know. Um, no, actually, it's funny. We did remember we went to that uh, some little hole in the wall bar we went to and drank coffee and talked about country music um, because you and Michael were both talking about Merle Haggard. Yeah. Was that in Portland? Was that at no? The that Starlight? was that was this Saratoga. was this was at Saratoga. Oh, Saratoga? This is at Saratoga, okay. and then uh, I think the next time I was at a um, a reading that Laird was doing in the city, and yep. Michael and Linda happened to be in town. I think you were visiting maybe yep. your son, your daughter. Oh, and, in New York City. Yeah, yeah, and you yeah. just came yeah. to the KGB reading, and then came uh, came to uh, uh, the restaurant, uh, the Chinese restaurant that that we used that to go fun. to after that. And then um, finally in, in um, San Jose, when mm -hmm. uh, uh, World Fantasy there. And uh, um, yeah, mm -hmm. so I had these sort of like an intensive exposures to Michael as a, as a person, you know, but then, then Laird would be like, yeah, I went and stayed with the Shays for three days. And, you know, he would tell me these insane stories that um, are probably true. And, um, uh, and so, yeah, so obviously that led me deeper into, into Michael's work. And I, I, I want to say that, you know, uh, even before that, uh, probably 2003 or, or thereabouts, I had read The Grow Limb um, and, and just been really amazed by that. I, I, I remember going back and rereading The Grow Limb a few, a few years later, actually several years later, and just thinking, holy cow, I did not appreciate this thing nearly as much as it, as it deserved um, when, really? uh, when I first read it. And, um, and yeah, so. somehow I snagged a copy uh, <clears throat> and it, um, like an arc of the Centipede Press edition of, uh, of, of Michael's stuff. And, uh, and I feel like I cannot understand how that came into my possession. I feel there must have been some uh, malfeasance involved on my part. But nonetheless, I, I just, you know, read through it, The Color Out of Time, which I, I really loved. I think The Color Out of Time reads to me like it, but, you know, as a novella. King's it, but just boiled down to this this perfect little thing. So uh, so yeah, he he, and as a, as a stylist, man, I mean, I mean, we've had some great stylists, but um, when yeah, when you when you think about great stylists that we've had within the realm of the fantastic or writers of the fantastic, I mean, you know, Shay's right at the right at the forefront of them. Mm -hmm. I like your pop up, Sam. You're not going to need to do any little in-window video editing of this, just Sam will provide all the covers. He's doing good, correct, yeah. Correct me, if, correct me if I'm wrong here, did not Michael, did Michael Shane not introduce us? Michael did, I did meet you through Michael and Linda, yeah. There was one morning that um, we were living in, on Dolores Street and Michael and Linda, had, I think they stayed over with us and they're like, we're going over to this guy Sam's house for pancakes. And we went over to your place and you made pancakes for us. Yeah. yeah, it was it was amazing. Hey, not to interrupt, but Mark, you need to introduce yourself. You haven't told for those who, who are not aware of who you are, you should I I did introduce myself. Did you? Yeah. Did you really introduce yourself? I don't think so. But go ahead, Laird, he, introduce him. He he did, but you know, tw twice is he did. Okay, then I was I good. you know I, I might have zoned out. Sorry. <laughs> Well, that doesn't say much for his introduction, does it? You're like, your introduction was so terrible. Blah, I didn't blah, even pay attention. Blah. No, oh, I, no I just, all right. I've, I've, I've known Mark for, what, 30 plus years, and I forgot who he is already. I guess. <laughs> Mark uh, introduced me to Michael and Linda, actually. So, at the convention, right? Yep. At, yeah, uh, it was probably in our West Con. Right. But, uh, I was really lucky because oh, right. I got to see you guys despite being kind of a hermit, I, I think I've probably seen Michael and Linda at conventions more than I've seen almost anybody, even like John would be the only other person I've seen more frequently at a convention. Mm -hmm. Just randomly would show up. We would happen to be there at the same time. It was, it was always felt like serendipity. It was really cool. But right, when I first started publishing, um, I was like three or four, you know, I was a, a story a year writer for a long time. And, uh, I was at a convention and I was hanging out with Gordon Van Gelder and, and, and Mark Laidlaw and Mark eventually introduced me to, we ran into the Shays and it was pretty cool because it was somebody, you know, Michael was somebody that his work had made a really huge impact on my writing and in more ways than I had really reckoned, even sitting here listening to people talking about, it, I realized 
more so that there are things that I do in my writing that I kind of feel like Michael gave me permission through his example. Like we go back to the autopsy. The autopsy is this very long novella. I, I don't know how many words it is, but it's, you know, between 20 and 30,000 words. It's pretty beefy. And it is something that be, it, it starts as one thing and gradually becomes something else. I don't want to give spoilers, but it, it changes at some point, but it doesn't do it like a lot of horror. Horror has a tendency to zap you at the end or do this really, just a really telegraphed right, right turn um, and go off into the, into the woods. Th this was very gradual, it, it creeping, sneaking up on you. You think it's one thing and it's something else. And, it all, and then of course it all ties together, but uh, it gave me permission in my own writing, I felt to uh, write it greater length and to digress mm -hmm. and to be and, and to not worry about all the rules i mean this is the thing is that it it violates a lot of the rules or at least seems to bend a lot of the rules that you'll get at a at typical um that's typical advice for writing courses and whatnot like say clarion or something you know start as close to the end as you can etc and so forth maybe he did maybe he didn't but it was it was leisurely as it as he walks you to your doom in the story and i began to really appreciate that in in other you know in other writers that that would emulate that kind of thing or had demonstrated that kind of thing so that to me that was one of the most powerful takeaways that i had from him as an author was just i said the fly is a very similar uh the extra he he would write these law and sometimes they're they're more streamlined it would get like a bullet but other times and more generally they would things that you would just have to be patient and eventually it's all going to tie together and it's going to, it's going to pay off. And, but he wrote without any care. Uh, he, I'm sure that privately he had his own, you know, he could have cared, you know, been worried about various things, but the affect is of a master just working on their craft and you can come along for the ride or not, but if you do, you're going to be rewarded. <clears throat> The autopsy is such a creepy story, and it occurs to me, Laird or whoever wants to answer this. Uh, let's say someone came up to you and said, "You, you know, you love Michael Shea. You were you were mentored by him, or you were influenced by him. Um, explain to me who he is as a writer. What's important about him? What would be some of the things you might say?" I think I've had had the floor. I should give that to. I mean, I've got yeah, stuff I can anyway. save. I think it should pass it to Mark or somebody. We're going to let John speak too, right? You can... If necessary, yes. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Laird. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, Mark, what would he, what's your, you know, for everybody, listen, Mark, introduce himself, but Mark is sort of like this gray eminence of, of, the, of our field. I mean, I don't know yeah. how many stories he's written. Many. Lots. Every mm -hmm. award, been up for all these awards, won many awards, just all, you know, and always is just a great story, but across the spectrum of horror, science fiction, and fantasy. So, what was, how would you sort of encapsulate, you know, Michael's writing? Um, he, well, so there, he was so poetic and elegant in a lot of his struck. It was the thing that Sam was talking about where, uh, he's really this tough, big, kind of craggy guy. And the prose presented like the, I had the same thing you had, Laird, when a story came out of his, it was big and substantial. And it felt like, oh, it, was, it had this gravity that was going to pull you in. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time wondering how he did that. And like, it just felt like he had made these things out of granite and dark wood and all this stuff. But then the, the verbal gymnastics and the, the, the way he used words, it was very fancy in a way, but he was, which you can see when he's writing his Kugel novel, Quest for Symbolists, you can see the Vance influences really there strong. But then when he was writing urban horror and stuff like the autopsy and Angel of Death and these things that had more of a real world setting, that same, intricacy of language and the willingness <clears throat> to look for the right word even if it was maybe going to put somebody off like he was not afraid of latin he's 
I, I might, one of my memories of Michael is when he stayed at our house and um, we had the New York Times crossword puzzle and Michael did it in, first of all, he did it in pen, which was a thing I'd never seen before. And there was always like a puzzle so that you're, you're solving a puzzle, some sort of elaborate pun that goes across several lines. He would often do that. He would do that first. <laughs> I could figure out the joke, and he would do that, and then fill in the rest, but without making mistakes. And I don't. I got the sense he did this a lot, but he had an incredible vocabulary and nimbleness and um, sinewy. I don't know. His his prose was just well. You, you got the sense that he worked at it really, really hard. And he yeah, did. you and you and I. I mean, I I remember talking to you and we would just you know we, we would read sentences to each other out of the Iraq yeah you know, for example and the the thing about them was that they were so they were muscular sentences and they were very Latinate mm -hmm. you know I mean, he was he was obviously a guy who was thinking very carefully I mean he was thinking almost mathematically about how you balance a clause here versus a clause there which descends from another clause and it, it just you know, so that it comes to the end and it's just got this, as you said, enormous weight. To and then it. he would break into poetry. So, I mean, it was never, it was always a very fine line between the prose that he was writing, which was very poetic, and then the poetry, which was very narrative, typically. But I was thinking a lot about the fantasy, the dark, the way he worked horror into his fantasy, like the Nif novels. The Arak and the Minds of Behemoth, it's like, they're incredible fantasy novels, but also incredible horror novels. He was like this great, sort of a Clark Ashton Smith, you know, reveling in the gruesomeness and the decay and everything is voluptuous and rotting and overgrown. And, and, and the language mirrors all that, but it's also there in the imagery. It's, just, it's kind of the whole package, which is why the thing that kills me, these, these novels feel like they had readers for a while who really appreciated them, but there is still a huge audience of people out there who would love these if they rediscovered them. They kind of don't know they exist for, for whatever reason. And I, I think that it'll come back. My, I mean, I hope this stuff all comes back. It's, it's amazing. Well, I think it might've been you who said that Mr. Candy Harm hasn't uh, gotten enough attention. That, I think if that book had come out when Michael had written it and I, and I know from talking to Linda, he was kind of uncertain of, of it in some respects. It feels like that was this masterwork book that he, that his fans and the people who had read the short fiction wanted something like this from him. Like this was the ultimate urban horror novel that Michael Shea could write. It was, it's got monsters, it's got cosmic horror. It's kind of Lovecraftian, but it's really Michael Shea. And um, I think it would have just blown people away at the time and he, because of the force of his personality was there too. You, you know, the fact, if Michael been around to give interviews about it and appear at conventions and all that, I think fans would have responded. So it's out there now, it's just kind of waiting for people to find out about it. I mean, I, I had high expectations of a full blown Michael Shea urban horror novel because we didn't get that while he was alive. And um, he, the, it does not disappoint. It's, uh, I mean, instant yes, classic. Really? It should have been a classic years ago, but to me, it's like it came out years ago and it's been there and people just don't know about it because it feels like it was a book of its time and it really feels like the stuff he was writing at the time he was writing it, which is right in there with the autopsy and Angel of Death and that kind of, kind of the first flush of Michael finding his voice and then, mm -hmm. With the mastery of the later like i know he worked on it he he, re, he worked on it over time too is that correct linda well what happened was it was sold way back then and it was supposed to come out um in the late 70s i guess the early 80s i can't remember i think yeah, i don't know if it was north american press it was someone like that an actual you know large house and then for some reason um, as so often happens in publishing, an editor gets canned or things change and whatever, the bottom falls out or there's something. And so what Michael did is what he always did. He just put it on the shelf, didn't think about it again and kept writing. Moved on to the next project. You know, he just never, he rarely looked back. 
at um, projects that had been done before. So I think that was the case with Kenny Harm. It just sort of sat, you know? So I, I think part of it is doing stuff like this and, you know, pointing out that, hey, um, look. And as you it, pointed out, Mike, it's on Kindle. It right, it's on Kindle bucks. Unlimited. You don't even have to have a Kindle. You can go pay a few bucks and read it on your laptop or your phone. Exactly. You know, Kindle app, right. and it's a few bucks. That's like. Yeah, I should probably do more about get, getting more you know? stuff on Kindle. I haven't done it, and I should do it. But there, you know, there is one thing that I want to say about um, sure. him and his approach to his job as a writer. You know, um, I think his job as a writer was to give what he called a good read. He wanted to give his his readers a good read. That was the thing. But his other job as a writer was to um, look to what he considered to be his strongest inspiration. And in that case, it was Caesar and it was Tacitus and it was Gibbon and it was Shakespeare and it was Bloom. And it was, you know, all those amazing people from the past and history. I mean, he was a big history buff. Um, and so he wasn't necessarily looking to the genres for any direction at all. I, and Dickens, oh my God, Dickens. And you can see that in uh, when he does colloquialism, when he does colloquial speak. And, very, and he taught for many, many years, he taught ESL to non-English speakers. And so not only that, coming growing up in LA, so you you really develop an ear for every kind of accent known if you grow up in LA or if you teach ESL for many many years. And <clears throat> he felt that it was in kind of a Dickinsonian sense that whatever the politics were, if he was going to get in trouble for it or not, you know, he wanted to portray that and. Um, it would come through in the writing. It came through in the way people spoke. And I get pleasure out of that, even though some people think maybe it's not politically correct, but I enjoy it very much. And as to what made him get his sentences, I guess I can only sum it up this way, that sometimes I'd walk by where he was writing. <clears throat> and in the old days when it was a manual typewriter, it was, ta -ta 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 -ta, you know, and then the computer, but it always reminded me of, the house being surrounded by rainfall, you know? And in the midst of it, you would hear this laughing. He just <laughs> done something that really amused him. And then you would also hear sometimes, da 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 As he was going back and he was reading the sentence to himself and testing the music, testing the dactyls, testing the da 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 you know? So that's where it was all coming from, the classics and the music that was in him. Um, I think he never looked to the genres. He had, he had writers in the genre he liked, like he admired the guy's work for sure. And also in movies, he was a great movie buff, but didn't, didn't pay attention. Mike turned me on to a lot of like crime. He was really into crime. Oh, like McDonald's? Yeah, and he, I yeah. think Michael turned me on to Williford, actually. Yeah. Well, and yeah. Don Heron and those guys, but uh, yeah. we have, and Mitchell Smith, for sure. I oh, guess. yes, he loved yeah. Mitchell Smith. And and he was a guy who would reread, if he loved a book, he would read it over and over again, too. Is, is Mitchell Smith the, the Stone City guy? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I read Daydreams Great was the one Michael was reading, and then I grabbed Stone City, which was, like, immediately one of my favorite books. But I don't think I was into, you know, I was just science fiction and horror. And then um, I started to discover like Elmore Leonard and those guys around the time that uh, Michael was turning me on to that stuff. So that was pretty, and maybe unexpected thing for him. I could see him doing sort of what Laird has been doing too, which is exploring that, writing crime novels and well, like that if he... I just want to put one more thing in, and I think that he came to believe that modern life is all one genre. It's all yeah, one genre. That's I mean, everything that we think of, hey, we don't have seasons anymore, you know, the way we used to. Um, we have genetic 
tampering, we have the possibility of, you know, staying alive forever. People talk about it. It's a goal. You know, it's space, uh, deep sea. I mean, it, just all of it. It's all one genre anymore. I think he really began to believe that. And I think that's one of the reasons why publishers had a hard time putting some of his books on a little spot on the shelves because they didn't really know what genre to put it in. I've, I've never and, heard it put quite that way, Linda, and that's really interesting uh, way to look at yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about modern life, you know? Yeah. Also, uh, Mark, I, I love hearing that other people, I know there's many of them, but I, I love it when I hear someone loved rereading books. You know, you're going back and you're, you're re revisiting a whole, uh, an old friend, you know, walking through a world that you love I walking in. I hardly ever read, reread anything. So I always, um, to me, that's an excellent quality in a person that, that I do not love. <laughs> <laughs> so I look up to people who reread and have their favorite book. I, I mean, there's a few things I reread, but I yeah. got this sense from Michael. He would, if he, if he liked something, he would latch onto it and then just study it and reread it and kind of digest it that way. I'm rereading um, a great trait. Something Wicked this way comes Bradbury, of course, mm -hmm. for the millionth time. And, and every time I read it, I find something new that I've missed, you know, so I, uh, I'm, an no. I'm an advocate. I'm sorry, Sam. You got something. Uh, to say? No, I'm, go ahead. I was just going to say real quick. Um, I believe in rereading, just as, from a technical standpoint. Same as martial arts or lifting. Bruce Lee said something to the effect of, "I don't fear the man who knows ten thousand moves. I fear the man who's practiced one move ten thousand times." Mm. And I read the <laughs> I read the autopsy a dozen times probably, and then I. And the best way to know a story is if you read it aloud. And I read it aloud one night, it took like three hours to read it, but I, I, I did read it to someone and uh, we were gonna read like half of it. And they're like, no, no, keep going. <laughs> They'd never, they had never read it before. So you I, have I was, to time it right too when you do that, Larry. There's like a thunderstorm building outside, you know, it's night, you know, that's the best time to read a story like the autopsy. <laughs> yeah, the I don't think it's, yeah. Is it's the old Nabokov finger wag, you know, he says that there is no such thing as reading. There is only rereading. Yeah, you know, I remember that, yeah. It's, you know, you go through it the first time and you're getting the characters and you're getting the, you know, the plot or whatever, whatever you're getting, but you don't get the texture and you don't get the architecture and you don't get the tricks of the trade Perhaps. until you go back and right. until you're familiar with all the stuff that kind of distracts you the first few times you're going through. Right. Yeah. He told actually he said something like that to me. I was some of the best moments I've had as a as a writer, just as a person, were some quiet moments when we were at happened to intersect at conventions and we would just hang out. And we were in Sar it was Saratoga. That was two thousand seven or eight, somewhere in there, and two thousand seven, I guess. And um, we were at the writers, you know, where everybody the autograph party and nobody really you know cared about us one way or the other. So we went and we filled out our little, just in case a fan showed up that wanted to have a sign something. We, we, he found a marker. We filled out our, our little placards and we just sat there and we chatted for about two hours. And it was some of the best, the best time I ever had. But he said, so what are you doing? What's going on? You know, I really liked that last story you did or whatever. And I said, yeah, I said, I, I was talking about my collection. I just said, oh, I'm all worried about, I'm keep my, I, I can't stand reading my stuff after it's published because it, they tell you reprint it you find all the errors and there's nothing you can do about it. He goes, oh, and I can't quite remember what he said, but it, I cracked up because he was, he goes, nobody notices that stuff unless they're looking to bring you down. Nobody notices that stuff the first couple times they read it. Right. He goes, do your best, but don't. So yeah, directly to what you're saying, he goes, about the, missing the architecture, he goes, in a well-written story, he goes, you need to read it five or six times before you even know the story at all in the first place. And he goes, and by then somebody who will put that kind of work in, they're going to forgive you your errors or it's your imperfections. Um, the fact that you don't wear makeup in the morning or whatever, the, the bottom line is though nobody notices that the first couple of times. So that that was a mouthful there uh, that I, I kind of carry with me to this day because there's multiple levels to that observation. Well, John, you want to jump in, jump in before I get to a next question or thought? Uh just I, I think what's fascinating to me in a way is is stylistically 
you know, I, I see Michael as, as a kind of inheritor, a continuation and inheritor of, of you know, uh, Mark mentioned, uh, mentioned Jack Vance, um, but, you know, also Clark Ashton Smith and, and somewhere in there, I feel like, is, uh, is Fritz Leiber, um, a, a different kind of stylist, but, but also a stylist and, and also uh, another kind of California writer. And, and everybody, you know, it's, it's, you can't, it, it, it seems to me an error to, to say that these guys are all, you know, the children of Lovecraft. Uh, that, that's, that's an oversimplification. No, and yet no. they, they draw on they're they're drawing on something similar i, I think it, and it's something that that genre fiction allows itself uh in the 20th century which is that sort of love of language and that willingness to play with language which to be fair you can find it in faulkner you can find it in cormac mccarthy it's not to say it's not to say that it's completely absent but it's just to say that that there are these that 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 you know, within the whatever the genre imprint, publishing imprint, or something like that, or bookshelf, there there really is room for these for people who want to do things with style, uh, for people who want to. I don't know who. I think it was probably Laird who told me that Michael really believed in uh, in rhyming poetry, and so you know that that for people who want to do that, who want to embrace that, uh, it seems to me that there's there's really still room for them there. Brad, I mean, Mike mm -hmm. mentioned rereading Bradbury, right? Um, and that he participates in, in that. There's also a part of me that has this weird theory that it's all connected to California somehow, but I can't quite make that, you know, Clark Ashton Smith, Fritz Leiber, you know, I can't quite make that fit, but I feel that there's something that Cody Goodfellow, I feel that there's probably something there as well. Uh, I, this is about Michael Shea, but no one can mention Fritz Leiber without me pulling this out. Not everyone that, that's read Fritz Leiber has read this, The Dealings of Daniel Kesserich. Um, yeah. really unique story uh, published years and years and years after his death. But it's a really neat novella. If you haven't read it, I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, and Henrik, before I get to the next, is there anything that you would like to add or you want me to move on or no, whatever you, you want? Uh, I didn't know Michael personally, so uh, I'll keep yeah. my <laughs> things for later. Okay, it's up to you. I, I didn't either, but I just thought this would be a really you know, I important do say conversation to have. Um, I think that Michael would, I used to say to him sometimes, because when he was younger, he was not interested particularly being a genre writer. He just wanted to write or do poetry. He started out as poet. And so I remember asking him, you know, why just the genres? Why, why don't you go into regular, you know, regular fiction? This was years ago, right? And he said something about that it was a tennis court with, with a net and with um, borders around it. And it was an understandable playing field in which he could do whatever he wanted. And um, That's great. yeah, and I thought that that was a, a pretty good analogy of the genres. Well, you know, you just- when you, you, when, you, when you talk about movies, um, there, there are a lot of filmmakers that uh, liked working in genre movies, uh, especially back in the you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, because they were disreputable and you know <laughs> low budget films yeah what that meant was you could get away with stuff that you couldn't get right. away with in a big budget apex because nobody's really paying attention to it exactly and you know I, I was on an interview with bruce campbell sam i apologize for interrupting and he said something almost exactly like that yeah no the, 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 bruce yeah. campbell is, is you know my beloved um well, I was don't get don't get me wrong. I'm not that important. I was on a phone conversation with like other reporters and things like that, and each of us got to ask one question. So, but that was really interesting to me. It wasn't my question, but he was like, "You understand all, all this B stuff? We can do whatever we want, you know." So yeah, exactly, exactly right. And so, you know, my suspicion is that maybe what he found was that by doing genre work. He could find, uh, you know, a, a paying market. He could find publishers that would let him oh, yeah. write, that would buy from him a story that, as long as it had enough sort of, you know, scary stuff going on in the in the in the foreground, let him write the kind of sentences he wanted to write. Yeah, you know, uh, which which are probably too, again, complicated and Latinate for just you know the usual best-selling market. I mean, 
I don't think that's the case in like the extra books, though, at all. Those are really pared down. Well, the, the extra the extra books just move. I mean, the extra they books just, are just move. Like, yeah, they're th those books are like bullets. I mean, Michael is such a movie junkie. He loved plots of all sorts, yeah. you know, just mo loved movies. And so um, I think that, and he admired Leonard so much, and yeah. Leonard is so pared down that he was trying to write in more of a screenwriter style for that. He was trying to keep it, keep it moving. Screenwriting, trust me, is a paraliterary form. <laughs> it's a visual form, you know, it's cinemographic, it's everything. It's not just literary. It's parasitical? Oh, wait, oh, parallel. Parasit <laughs> doesn't, doesn't, doesn't involve actual English, that's the thing. Well, it doesn't have to. <laughs> You know, there's... One, one comment about Please. regionalism. This was because John mentioned California. There was a California quality and um, Laird talking about regionalism and writers. This, yeah. this was a big deal for me with Michael's stuff because watching him, I mean, from what I knew about him personally, I was excited when he moved from the city to the country because I knew we were going to get that the embeddedness of the landscape and the reality of the city urban horror stuff we were going to get the country version of that <clears throat> and in fact he did that with when you started to see it in stories like mama dirt and stuff like that it's like oh he's he's moving to the country now he's going to write about the country this is going to be amazing so you definitely mm -hmm. i had the, always had that feeling with michael it was so interesting when he was writing about place and and uh, and he, I mean, Kenny Harm is a San Francisco story, uh, uh, but but when he when he moved when you guys moved up to Windsor and Santa Rosa and stuff, then the right. settings changed and the, the kind of the stories changed. That was really fun to well. To watch. It he don't you know he'd grown up um, in L.A. going up into the Baldwin Hills and he was a Boy Scout, you know, and all those kind of things, and so he had a well established as a kid on a bike being able to bike all over LA you know back then um, he had a well-established bond with nature that was very very real but I think that what it did for him to be in the country was it just gave him fodder for his sense of of wonder mm, and yeah. I think that the essential thing of horror for Michael was you know certainly not slasher garbage it was nothing like that it was the fact that it is so beautiful and so amazing and so magnificent and all of us are going to lose it. And that 24 hours a day, milliseconds by the hundreds of millions of times, the machine is churning and making new life and taking life with a mechanicity, which is unimaginable. And I think hence the spiders, they were a, a real, a symbol of that because of their beauty and their incredible machine like you know they were machines like the planets that turn right in the yeah. same sense of a giant machine so the country and california with all its wonderful country the hawks and the hills and you know everything um that clark ash and smith used that many california writers used um it fed the sense of wonder and the sense of loss and um, yeah and I just want to bring up one little thing that in this book that's coming out from uh, Hippocampus Press there and it's the new it's going to be a new collection actually what, what's um, the title? Uh, it's called the autopsy best weird tales of Michael Shea oh great and the reason the autopsy is because of the Netflix autopsy that's coming out this year, theoretically. And so the publishers have kind of glommed on to the autopsy title, right? But- um, oh, Wait a second, the this, this story is gonna be on Netflix? Yeah, yeah. Del Toro. I, guess I, didn't, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, that, Del, that, that series that Del Toro- Cabinet of Curiosities, yeah, yeah. Del Toro's. Anyway, so, but there's a story in this collection, there's a couple of unpublished stories and plus several that were published, but never republished, you know, like Algis Budras published them or Scream Factory or whatever. Um, and the one that I'm thinking of that in a strange kind of way, 
actually was not a genre piece at all, but I think it kind of anchors the collection is called Feeding Spiders. And, it, and the pro tag is a kid in his backyard in Los Angeles across from, you know, Culver City, in Culver City across from MGM Studios. And you can see the nation horror writer, you know, being amazed and mystified and stunned by that machinery that I was talking about in the spiders. So I think it really kind of anchors that whole collection in a, in a strange kind of way and a, you know, in an almost autobiographical weird kind of way. So. My favorite types of horror stories are that sense of wonder that, you, that you're talking about. And, Me too. Uh, you know, uh, that sense of awe and even if something is terrible, it can be beautiful. Um, I, my hope is that knowing this now that Del Toro's uh, putting that on Netflix as an episode, maybe this makes some people go, oh, I want to, you know, want to read more by this author. That would be great. Um, smart, they'll put on the, the book will just be called Guillermo Del Toro's Michael Shea's The Autopsy. <laughs> <laughs> whatever whatever sells well, Toro presents um so you know uh when we were doing this podcast with cody and philip a while back uh laird said something about this sense of place um and i correct me if i'm wrong i don't i'm not gonna have it quite right Larry. but you said when you went to visit uh michael shea you could see oh well, that's their you know uh, you felt like you were absolutely in the land where he was writing these stories. I'm badly paraphrasing that, but oh, I, I don't remember what I said. And like I said, I'll share I'll share the the essay because it it mentions yeah. it's not about Michael, but it he definitely is sort of like the the John Langan rapper rap, the the story within a story. And um, yeah, it was in 2009. And normally when you fly across the country, it's you know you're in a big jet and you're at 30,000 feet. But I flew out of I lived in Olympia at the time, but I came out of Portland. So I took a puddle jumper to Portland and then I, we were just, you know, there's like 30 people on the plane. It was one of those, a small jet, you know, just a step above a, a large, just a step above a private jet. And we came in over, I, I guess the central Valley or wherever we came in like over, you know, coming into the, it was a Charles Schultz airport, yeah. um, Memorial airport, which is just, it's this tiny little, it's just this tiny little airport. It's you like know, a it's hangar. Nice. It's beautiful, but it's just this little hangar. But when I was coming in, the last few minutes of the flight, you could see the make and model of cars driving beneath us and people walking around. And the oak trees were coming up and there was vineyards and, you know, all of that, the different colors all the way out to the ocean. You know, you had the green and the just the way that he would describe it, just sort of like this motley of colors and that are a spectrum of death up in the dusty hills all the way down to the life-giving ocean and yeah i knew that one thing i was going to say when we were talking about his sense of place a he's a muscular very physical writer that's one of the things that always attracted me to his writing because i was living in alaska when i first started reading him and there's a certain poet there's there's all the different ways to be a man he had a specific type of masculine or to be to be masculine right there's not just the john when people say stuff like that they used to mean john wayne they're a man if you're you know, no 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 there's many different ways his particular way of demonstrating masculinity was something that i really liked and it it, it was thoughtful and sensitive but also he could take care of business you knew this guy knew how to swing a hammer throw a punch and survive if necessary dance all that stuff right like there's a very fatherly, like a paternal or, or avuncular, like like the uncle who came back from the war and, you know, had seen some things. There, there was there was sort of that vibe in his writing. And it contained multitudes, as Whitman, uh, Whitman would say. But one thing is the duality of his writing is another thing that struck me. Uh, there's no real difference. And I, I, we talked about it briefly, but I don't remember quite where the conversation went, but we, I remember discussing that with him on a couple of occasions and essentially the, the take being that there's not a lot of difference between, if any difference between an urban jungle and a, and a jungle that they are simply, they're different manifestations of what we're all kind of what we're all living in and going through. 
there's with man and without man kind of an idea. And so, yes, they're externally different, but there's, there's a sort of symbiotic or not symbiotic, but kind of like this intersection between the urban and the, and the rural or, or wilderness settings. And they all just sort of, they're different faces of Eve kind of a thing, which is, that's more my, how I interpreted what he was saying. I'm not going to say what he said, but when I see the work itself, there's a seamlessness between his urban depictions, descriptions, characterizations, and his wilderness, or he doesn't really do so much wilderness, but definitely rural or deep rural stuff. They're, they're different in the superficial ways that those environments and biomes are different, but there's also the synergy or, or uh, uh, kinship between them. So it doesn't surprise me at all that he could just move to an area and absorb it and then translate it back in, into fiction. But it, it is something that I noticed and I responded to. I started reading him when I was probably 18, 19, you know, uh, because of Dark Descent. I read, I read The Autopsy, which had been reprinted there. And I, I forget, uh, Hartwell, I think, had said something in the preface that, you know, he was essentially uh, an overlooked gem. That this is like one of our greatest writers, you know, kind of, but a well kept secret um, outside the community. And so I paid attention because that's a, that's a seminal book, that anthology, The Dark mm -hmm. Descent. And so I started finding more of his stuff, but I didn't have a, I didn't get a hold of Polyphemus till years later. So I read back issue of this and I found an anthology there. But one thing I've, I've, I've noted as a reader and as a writer is just that he could write, he could pretty much write people anywhere, but he could also, the, the setting could be any kind of a setting. And it, it, it wouldn't matter. He's going to immerse you in that setting because he understood that fundamentally it is. It goes back to what Linda said. There's one genre. It's all one setting too, really. Yeah. Um, probably preaching to the choir when it comes to the patrons for the next couple of weeks. But as far as, um, you know, I guess in some ways I see him still as a um, undiscovered gem in many ways. Um, there's so much out there today. So for the person who has not read Michael Shea, um, what would you say to them? What, you know, divert your attention in, over here and look at what, he, what Michael Shea has written. I'll go. Um, I don't know if you can get a hold of Polyphemus, how easily, but that's, that's where it all started. Mm -hmm. um, you could read Demiurge, but that's, you know, some of these are um, specific, like these are his Cthulhu mythos tales, as opposed right. to like his other stuff. Like if you want to get a real sense of him, I, uh, I, I would say maybe get ready to pick up this, um, this book that, that Linda's talking about or something like that. I mean, when Valancourt announced that they were releasing the Carl Edward Wagner, you know, in a lonely place, uh, first thing I said is, hey, okay, because Wagner's one of my, I consider him, Michael Shea, and Don Webb in some ways, like the, the Cerberus of that kind of horror in the 80s into the 90s. And I really think that it was important to bring to bring Wagner back. But I said, you guys need to do, you, you need to do uh, Michael Shea. And I, well, and I hope that they do. They listen to you because they want to do Polyphemus. Yes, okay. Valancourt, <laughs> Valancourt is perfect. Valancourt is- You think is so? Perfect. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Because yeah. I'm just kind of like winging it here. I don't no, know. No, no. You know I, I thank you. I don't know anything about their business. You know, I cannot say anything. I've never dealt with them as a, on a business level, so I'm not. They sound one. great that way. I just oh, it seemed from looking at their other books, it seemed like a good fit. Yes, uh, but looking at it as a reader or as a writer, that would be you know, like if somebody said to me, "Something's coming out from Val. We're going to do Valancourt's going to bring something." I would be ecstatic. I think that they're like one of the preeminent publishers Good. for this especially for this kind of a project but yes so everybody out there as soon as this comes out first of all get anything you can but some of the stuff's hard to get like the collections are hard to get as soon as polyphemus right. comes out it, it is a uh, a landmark and, and mark laidlaw has said that in the past that it's a that's a landmark collection and uh, Jared is re-releasing the Centipede Press Autopsy and Other Tales, and he's re-releasing it in a smaller book and less expensive. Very really? Good. That'd be great. Yeah. That yeah. is great to hear. Yeah, so it'll be more accessible to... And he did a NIFT, but that was a collector's NIFT, you know, so it was not cheap. 
when all. Yeah. I'm super happy to hear this. That make that, that makes my day. That those two things. I mean, all th- all three of the things. You know, the uh, the other the <laughs> other uh, the other one called autopsy or similarly titled. But the the autopsy one that Centipede did is also, I think, super important because it collects. It's an amazing book. Right? Doesn't it have pretty much everything in Polyphemus, and then other then there's a bunch of other things too. But yeah, just, there's more stuff in it. And right. I believe it has the grow limb, which Yes, it does. Yep. And to me, I mean the grow it yeah, it's massive. Right. I did I, I, I was... that's what, that lets you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean the, to me, the Grolin did win a one world fantasy award, but somehow or another, I don't know what it was. I, I know that Michael thought of it. And then a few days later, I don't know when he thought of it, but if you, and it's obviously our property. If you know anyone who's been here knows it's the log cabin on the hill, right? Kind of thing. But um, he actually said to me that he had written a story and it scared him. He had thought of a story and it scared him. And that was not something that ever happened really in that way. But this one scared him when he thought of it like almost should I not write it should, you know that kind of thing and um I think it's an amazing amazing story so I was really glad when it was in that centipede press book the those are works of art but they're not always they're not accessible most of the time to the average reader you know they're worth every penny don't get me wrong the centipede oh press you mean books. the big books yeah. yeah so I'm glad he's doing a less expensive one right Exactly. Everybody should get that. That would be a priority if I were a horror reader to get a hold of that book. Yeah. Uh, I would. I would love to have you know if there was some enterprising uh, paperback publisher who could uh, break the autopsy up into three volumes the way that they used to do. I mean, I think the mass market editions of the Dark Descent, which Laird was just talking about. Oh yeah, you're right. Were originally published as like Dark Descent Volume One, Volume Two, and Volume Three. But right. The, 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 uh, if you could get you could get the entire contents of um, the of the centipede autopsy available to the public in sort of manageably sized and you know obviously less expensive editions. That would be a, a great way to go. It's a great idea. Speaking of dark descent, a few years ago I sat down to read it through from start to finish, <laughs> and when I got to the autopsy. Um, I didn't get much farther because it was so much the best story in the, that in that huge volume of classic stuff. It's the best written story in the whole thing, and it was it's amazing how well it holds up. So it's definitely if you haven't read the autopsy, even in context of that sort of landmark collection, it's it's stand out. I lobbied, I, I begged Joe Dante, let's do the autopsy. When we were, um, we did two episodes for Masters of Horror. And right. the first one went well, and we were casting around for a, casting around for a second one. And, I was, uh, and he, he just, he didn't, I kept saying, all right, I don't know how to do it yet, but I will find a way to, his, his, his fear was that it was too interior. That so much of what happens in the story is, inside a guy's head it's planning it's not going to it's not going to manifest itself visually and i said no we, we, we will we will find a way to do that trust me but he you could have it. done it sam you could have done a great job of it i wish you'd done it he, 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 didn't, he didn't believe me on that one. and the the situation that turned out he'd been trying for 15 years to do the screw fly solution the james james tiptree story the recognition uh-huh. that actually was the, was the um, pseudonym that she used on that one and um they wouldn't deal with him before he wanted to do that for the, his first episode of Masters of Horror. Uh, they changed their mind and said, okay, you guys can have it now. And he was just, he was just all over that from that point on. But I mean, Linda, you know, I've, I've always, wanted, I've always I know, I know. Well, you know, I don't really have any faith that it's actually going to happen because like Stuart Gordon and Ben Browning bought it maybe 15 years ago and what was the name of that series I can't remember but it was something and they were going to do it and it and I remember hearing a couple of uh, makeup artists in uh, in an elevator actually talking about it like they were working on it on it you know at a convention somewhere and I thought wow it's really going to happen and then that ca- that series got canceled and so when 
you know, COVID hit just when they're supposedly working on the autopsy for Del Toro. I thought, oh man, here it goes again. So well, it's, when listed on, it's listed on IMDb at the moment as episode number two. I don't know what the hell they're going to have as episode number one. But I uh, think Del know. Toro wrote one, wrote a yeah. couple for it. I think they're going to start with one of his. They have Henry Cotton's The Graveyard Rats. That's one of the stories that they're going to do. There are a few others. I don't know. Yeah. Well, they just released a teaser for the series. Yeah, I saw that. That looks yes. great. Yes. So hopefully that means something, you know. Well, you know, Del Toro's Del Toro's a smart guy, and, and you know, Mark was making the joke about Guillermo Del Toro's Michael Shea's The Autopsy. I'm thinking of but, Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Drac Dracula by Fred <laughs> Saberhagen. That's right, exactly. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, uh, Del Toro uh, curated a bunch of horror novels for Penguin and wrote, you know, very he wrote very smart introductions for them. Uh, from, uh -huh. the, uh, from the from the fifties and sixties back in the he's a connoisseur for sure. sure. Doesn't he have thousands of books? About Michael's work than any of us. What's that? I wonder. I well, I think he has thousands and thousands of fantasy and horror books, right? I've read that, but yeah. I wonder if he's ever seen any of the mythos stuff because that seems up his alley with Hellboy and everything. Del Toro. There's supposed to be yeah. two, two uh, Lovecraftian stories in that series. So that's what I've heard. Uh, he did I mean, you for Mountains of Madness. So I, he definitely knows all that shit. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's he's, he's real. I say yeah. he probably knows all. He probably knows Michael's work really well. I would imagine. He's yeah. extremely well read in like the supernatural horror and literature kind of thing. Yeah. The the new movie that he just uh, released. It was a departure from what you expect of him. It was very different. Del Toro. I thought. What was that? The Carnival Row. The one with Kate Blanchett. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's quite mm -hmm. different. Uh, interesting. Anyway. For those who might listen to this later and they've read um, no Michael Shea stories, what are some places where they should start? Should they start with the autopsy short stories? Should they start with something longer? What do you guys think? And then move on after that one, of course. Depends on whether they like science fiction or they like horror or they like mythos or they like, you know, he he did so many of them, so many of those. Well, I, I would say that, most of my crowd would probably be uh, horror in general and mythos, you know. So. Yeah, because, right, okay. Horror writer, horror, horror readers are really open to short stories, so I, they, they probably read more short fiction a lot of other types of readers but um it seems like a lot of people like to sink their teeth into a novel so i would i would not be afraid to jump into mr canny harm partly because it's probably the most accessible thing right now but yeah it is you're left kind of hunting for short stories and it's the fantasy stuff is great too but it's it's also hard to find right now uh, those guys, I, one, another one, another one that I always liked that I, you know, I, I threw this out to Joe Dante too was Fat Face. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is. Uh, and yeah. I'm really fond of Copping Squid, the story Copping Squid. Yeah. yeah, I think that's very accessible. I mean, it's San Francisco streets, it's crowds, it's it's just, I don't know. I think it's great. So I think that would be a good one, especially with a sense of humor. But I would, you know, I would say, you know, get a get a book full of stories because his range is just such that you're, I mean, you can, it's it's like the blind man and the elephant, you know, if you come in and you've read one Michael Shea story, you think, oh, he's a Thulu Mythos guy, you know, or he's a Jack Vance guy or, you know, something like that, or he's a, you know, an urban, uh, uh, an urban horror guy. And you sort of have to see all that stuff together to get a sense of what he is right I mean, because there's so much he could do and uh i, I you know I, I, that's that's what I, I would i would say you know go for a big general anthology instead of one of the themed anthologies because you just get you know holy cow he can do that too you know yeah i remember uh, Larry uh, telling me how funny he thought phil it with regular was you know oh, country yeah. Country horror. Uncle Tugs. 
Uncle yeah, Tugs. I was just going to say. That yeah. was one I had been reading him for years, but for whatever reason, had not or didn't remember it. I, I'm guilty of reading a lot of stuff when I was younger and not even knowing who wrote it. I would just read, yeah. toss the paperback over my shoulder, read the next person. And, you know, I did completely oblivious to who may have written it. Um, but Uncle Tug is something I read about 20 years ago now. And I remember I was about two in the morning and I was on a weekend from work and I was reading it. And I started laughing so hard. And this goes back to like, just the kind of writer he he was, uh, the humor that he had, this darkness. It's not, the story is not necessarily intended to be humorous, but it it was so it true. Is. It was so <laughs> true to is. the darkness that I remember from my childhood in Alaska and some of the people I hung out with that I, I laughed so hard. I, I, I thought I was gonna have a heart attack. I thought I was gonna, remember my wife was like, are you, are you, you know, she thought she was gonna give me CPR because I, I fell out of bed, like landed on the floor and I was lying there with just tears streaming down my face because i was laughing i couldn't breathe i was laughing so hard and it's one cause of, of death michael shea story he killed me <laughs> which would have been apropos because that's a story about a ghost basically or a spirit and mm -hmm. it's just horrible it's just this hor it's a, a like a simple plan things just get they spiral out of control but over the course of about 20 30 pages you know it's just it's very tight yeah but he had great uh great humor and i agree with sam you know hunt around and find what you can find but you're not going to get the measure of Shea by reading uh, just the Cthulhu myth, like because there's some stuff packages is this Cthulhu mythos story, and that's that's abs or stories, and that's absolutely true. But like if you wanted to, to sample the range, you'd have to get either one some of these things that are really hard to get, or just be a little bit patient, mark it down, pre-order. Matter of fact, pre-order that helps that helps a lot when Valancourt has a pre-order page, or when I don't know who's publishing the other one, but. You know, or go and go read Canny Harm. Canny Harm embodies a lot of his uh, his loves too. There, there is cosmic horror in there, and there is this brutal. There's a real brutal edge to some of his writing, and it's unapologetically raw, as raw as yes. anything the literary writers like to pride themselves. See, that's the thing is, you know, you know, lit, lit stories are famous for having sort of like the anti climax, and there was nothing left to do as miss barkley you know died in childbirth so i just drove away that was that there's no res you know, it's just like oh she died and that, that chapter is over my of my life where genre would be he rushed to the hospital with a life giving serum and revivify you know or maybe herbert west revivified or something that would be a genre story he was really good at going it there are no rules you know this is i'm going to give you literary but also there's going to be a pulp or, or a pulp story with a literary aesthetic and I'm going to give you a, yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you true. some kind of closure in, in a story. Maybe not good, but there's closure. But I, I will say this just before I sign off on this one. Uh, I said the fly, which I don't know if you can get a hold of it, has the best, oh, it's in, it's in, it will be recollected, I'm sure, when they do this more affordable release by Centipede Press. One of the greatest novellas, horror novellas ever. It's on par, I, for my money, with Fat Face and The Autopsy. But it has the, for me, the single best ending. It's right up there with To Build a Fire. I think To Build a Fire probably has one of the greatest endings of any story ever London? written. Of any Is story ever London? written, any genre. Yeah, by, by London. I think that this is in that, like if I were going to do a top five, I said The Fly is right yeah. there. It has the greatest, one of the, that and Carl Edward Wagner did a story at the end of uh, Summer's End or Where the Summer Ends. And I'm going to, I'm not going to blow that one, but there's a, there's this famous line at the end of that story. Michael Shea accomplished that level of Zen, Zen, like he was in the zone when he came up with the end. I said the fly, the last sentence is just like a nail. It's just like a nail right through you. Um, when's that collection coming out again, Linda? It's supposed to come out this year. Okay. Yeah. And then also, I just want to say that particularly <laughs> for, you know, your listeners, any of the Lovecraft collections like Demiurge or um, the PS, you know, publishing, I mean, they're not, the Demiurge particularly is still being published. I mean, it's still being released. Yeah. And it's, you yeah, can it is on Kindle, Kindle Unlimited, as a matter of fact. Yeah. That, that one has for your readers too. I mean, I mean, for your listeners, there, it's the Lovecraft, you know, the mythos tales. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's, if you want to read Shay's Lovecraft stories, that's the place to start if you're in that mood. You know, yeah. right. canny harm too, right, Laird? Oh yeah. Um, um, yeah, I think right. Well, Linda would know. Even I mean, I don't want to. No. 
County harm, definitely, yeah. But you know, um, it's it's, I, an, it's not. I didn't think it was doing County harm a lot of favors to market it as Lovecraftian, though it was based on the Hound, which I had to be right. reminded of this. It's not totally it apparent. Yeah. It doesn't have Cthulhu in it, and it doesn't have tentacles but, and that stuff. It's got I think the he did visionary horror thing, <laughs> right? Going on. But doesn't he do that in all his stories? It's kind of all his Lovecraftian yeah. stories. It's kind of an aside to it. It's not the central, or you find out later. But as yeah. the story is evolving, it's not the biggest piece. Fat face is a good example. I said the fly or fat face are examples of that, yeah. where the cosmic horror is something that comes in, and right. Annie Harms the same way it com it comes in. And you know, to be perfectly strict, te te technically, you know, te technical about it, it is Lovecraftian because the biggest mistake everybody makes about Lovecraft is it's about Cthulhu and that's like a finite more, more Cthulhu was written by everybody that came after Lovecraft and Love, Lovecraft Lovecraft had a few stories like that but he also had like you said the hound the picture in the house which is my favorite Lovecraft story and Michael's take on Lovecraft that's that's why I was saying earlier if you're in a if you're in kind of what you consider to be the the Cthulhu end of the Lovecraftian spectrum then yeah he's got a bunch of stories or a few stories like that and, and, and you should go look up Demiurge or whatever. I was just saying that the other stuff's Lovecraftian too in its own way, but I think it is more accurate to Mark's point to call it or to think of it more as cosmic horror rather than put a, than put Which an author I'm more label. interested in anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, he always made, listen, even the Lovecraftian like stuff that he told me he felt were pastiche are much like Willem Pugmire. They are their own thing that's the ecstasy of influence which is an, just got another gift from from michael as a writer um is, is there's the you know there's basically the anxiety of influence and there's the ecstasy and he demonstrated i don't know how he felt about it but he demonstrated hey look i can i can build on the stuff that came before and, and do my own thing with it i'm not repeating it i'm doing some i'm taking that platform and i'm gonna i'm gonna build out this direction mm -hmm. with it as my as my as my starting point um so i really admire i admire that about him so you can you can no matter what it is you're gonna get uh it's gonna be shay yeah i'd like to say something here uh if yes. it's okay speaking about the uniqueness of uh, uh lovecraft stories uh, he did something that really impressed me, and that was uh, two things. The first was that uh, in Lovecraft stories, when the protagonist sees something horrible, they go insane. But in Shea's stories, often they experience a dark miracle. They became sort of cultists, they become religious. And that is a very interesting take on the Cthulhu mythos. And also, that, uh, that this ties into that, that... Um, uh, the, the, the theme of addiction, uh, this sort of a uh, thought contagion that comes with that. It's very interesting that, that, that Shay does in his stories. Very apparent in Copping Squid and in Sathagwa, one of my favorites. <laughs> really talked about story in his uh, Lovecraft collection. I really like Sathagwa. Uh, Me too, as yeah. As, yeah. As we were talking like about it. this before, I would like to mention that uh, because everybody always talks about Copping Squid or uh, Fat Face. Uh, this is also a very good story. It has very cinematic moments in it. Well, that whole idea. Spoil. Yeah, well, that whole idea of parasitism was a theme that he was quite intrigued with, and the show got and you know their joy is not just to eat us, but they want to experience us. They want to taste us, right? Mm -hmm. So that's parasitism of your thoughts and your spirit. So. Uh, that was very unique, Mr. Dark. <laughs> and uh, something wicked this way comes. Same thing. Yeah. Are any of his stories or short his, his novels or short stories on uh, audio? Have any uh, yeah. The um, the strangely enough, the tour books are on audio. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah, they're on uh, the 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 extra series. They're on audio, yeah. Okay. And um, there's something else on Audible, and oh, excuse me, I can't remember what it is right now. But there's one of the books is on Audible as well. I'll uh, take a quick look. Is there anything that you know really I haven't thought to bring up or ask or mention that that we should talk about, guys? Oh, 
I just want to throw one thing out. Sure. Um, and that's I, with I said the fly. Um, you know, one of the things I remember being struck by when I when I read that was, uh, you know, that, that it, it was sort of like veering in the direction of like Beckett or Beckett and Ligotti or, or that really and that really fascinated me. It really fascinated me that, you know, it was this this, you know, as with Ligotti, you get like sort of puppetry and stuff like that. Mm. And and there's this sort of um, universe, like this absurd universe, you know, and, and, and obviously like you can see an overlap right or or, or at least um an edging where where absurdism and and lovecraft sort of like and cosmic horror rub up against each other right we we live in this big universe we think we're so important we're not and, and so on but but i thought that that i said the fly did it in in this particular way that that i thought you know if you had told me this was something that uh European surrealist from the mid 20th century had produced, I would have been like, oh, yeah, I know, sure, I could totally see this. And, and I think, um, you know, if you want to think about, uh, again, about about Shay's range as a writer, um, that that's, you know, it, it's this thing that just um, uh, is is cosmic horror, but, but of a just its own particular kind. And again, we can, you know, we can, I feel like we say cosmic horror, right? And yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, right, like Lovecraft. And and I agree with Laird that like in that deeper sense, maybe of a kind of visionary sense of, of this vast impersonal universe and, and possibly, you know, but they hostile. Mean, but they mean tentacles when they say it. What you know, mean. I know, I know, I know. But but this is no tentacles in this. But, um, but yeah, the, there's just something about it that, um, is, is its own weird kind of thing. Um, and did you yeah. find it, para, like the paranoia too, that's something I've been meaning to inject in the conversation yeah, yeah, about. Yeah. We talk about his writing. He likes to write, he liked to write a lot about street level people, not just blue collar, but street, you know, people who are li literally one step away or from being homeless or maybe they are homeless, uh, ragged edge kind of living, but also, uh, and, not, and really no judgment implied, just this is, I'm writing the story about these people. This is what's happening to them. But the paranoia, I thought I said the fly, it really encapsulates the paranoia that is sort of like this undercurrent or in some places very explicit in his writing. Right. Well, just because you're paranoid, you know, doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Right. I mean, and... they are out to get you. Yeah. 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 I was yeah, doing yeah. a little searching while you guys were talking about that story. And man, you can't find that anywhere. So... I actually found it on eBay. The, when oh, the, um, when the, uh, when the centipede press when the when the arc came out there were two things that were not included in the arc uh the color out of time and i said the fly and so i went searching for them and i can't remember where i found the color out of time but i did but on ebay i found a, a an edition of i said the fly and at that point it was it was reasonably priced i don't know what it would be like now color out of time was not too hard to find but um i've got that on my on my shelf but i said the fly i've never been able to read that one I want to say I said the fly was in one of Ellen Datlow's Omni collections. I was going to say, Ellen, I first heard about that story, I think, from Ellen. It's too bad she couldn't be here tonight because she probably has some more insights. Into yeah. I think she's, she's out of the country. country. I would have asked her. Yeah. I have um, also a question for Linda um, about more posthumous stuff, more stuff that might be close to public. <laughs> there was well, stuff there's some stuff I remember Michael talking about for years, like projects he was working on for There's years. There's an amazing contemporary novel set in Northern California called Mama Dirt. Yep. And oh, yeah, he did Mama a Dirt. short story. He did a short story of it after the, after the uh, novel was written and on the shelf for a really long time. He actually let a little bit of it go as short story, which really wasn't his style, but he did it. Um, there was, and he used to talk about there, something called Plunderers. The, the plunderers, plunderers, I don't think is complete enough. It's about three quarters there, mm. but there just isn't enough. You know, it's just not done. Forget the title. It yeah, title. yeah, no, it's really wow. great. And there is um, uh, another NIFT, which actually in the chronology of NIFT, I think would have been like the second book. It would have been before um, the ones that were more used to Minds of Behemoth and Iraq, and that's there. And um, this is a terrible confession, but you know that book that came out uh, by Lynn Cesar, Apricot Brandy? I had to be the beard for that because he got this 
bug up his butt that he was going to release it under a different name. And I didn't want to do it. I did it. I, I, um, I heard it, you know, I proofed it, I helped, I put comments in it, but that's his and that's out there. That's prime books wow. and that's gettable. And that one is apricot brandy. Yeah. I remember Michael talking for years about. Yeah. Yeah. Brandy, and then it came out with also Northern California. Yeah. From that period. Yeah. And so, and I, I just want to say something to something that Henrik said that um, really is very true. I always felt that there was kind of an optimism in amidst all of this. And that optimism did really kind of come from a, a religious place, not traditional religion, but that thing that you said about that um, the Lovecraft is almost religious, like a religious experience, that the optimism of being connected to this whole giant universe, this whole, I guess, cosmic horror um, was something that I always felt that gave the work a lot of strength. And, and also, uh, we have to mention that it, uh, it, at least the mythos stories are about working class people. And it's uh, about, the, they, they're taking us to fight. Am I making what? sense clear? Oh, sorry. It's about working class people fighting. And, uh, yes. and a lot of those mythos stories about, is about that, the San Francisco stories. That they, mm -hmm. they, they fight the mythos. It's like, it's like a John Carpenter movie. They, they take hatchets and they go at the monsters. Right, right. The blue collar guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you're right. As opposed to your Lovecraft guy who's a scholar. and Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah, it's uh, real life. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else, guys? Sam, John, Laird, Mark, Linda? Um, um, thank you. For all of you. Oh, sure. I, I hope we covered everything. Um, I, I'm i coming at the whole thing as a reader. You know, I never never got to meet him, but obviously he was a huge impact on, on you guys and a lot of people. So <laughs> oh, I, I've got one in the background, too. So I'm <laughs> laying on my piano bench back there. Uh, so, guys, thanks for being here and, and talking about it. And Linda. Shay, especially, thank you for being here. And, oh, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I always say more than I want to, but thank you so much, everyone, really. No, it was, it was wonderful perfect. to see you, you and to hear you. It was good. All right. Thank you so much for having us. I mean, it's, it, it is an honor to sit here and, and talk about Michael Shea with a, a, a bunch of people who love him. So good to That's see you, um, Linda. It's good to see all you guys. Oh, it's good to yeah. see you good all. Good I miss you guys. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks, everybody. And um, I'm sure we'll all talk soon. And thank you for being thank here. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Bye. Mike. Thank you. It's a lot. Thank, thank you, Mike. Yeah.